Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Today's topic is GOP ranks full of Christian nationalists. Uh, back in 2016, Hillary Clinton spoke up at a fundraising uh, event, and she spoke up and she spoke out that the, the followers of Donald Trump, specifically the MAGA followers, were a basket of deplorables. And what she meant by basket deplorables was she identified racists, the sexist, homophobic, the xenophobic, and the Islamophobic. Uh, the roar of protest that followed her, her words was deafening. Uh, Hillary Clinton retreated. She apologized. Uh, since that time, since 2016, we, uh, we've seen all sorts of groups come out of the GOP. We've seen the, uh, the MAGA wing support uh, neo-Nazis. Uh, the white supremacists to include Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers. And of recent, we've been watching a lot of uh, what I would call Putin cheerleaders, those that want to see Russia succeed and not, uh, not NATO or Ukraine. Uh, remember, Donald Trump, uh, in one of the debates, uh, said about the Proud Boys, uh, stand back and stand ready. That was just before uh, January 6th took place. So fast forward to this weekend at CPAC, uh, the Conservative Political Action Committee uh, Forum, where a gentleman by the name of Jack Prosbiak sat on a discussion panel with Steve Bannon, of all people. Uh, again, this is uh, where all the, the Republicans like to go in Florida and, and uh, thump their chest and, 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 and display uh, their positions on how the world should run, how the country should run. And what uh, did Jack Prozovic say? He said the following, we're here to overthrow democracy. We didn't get it all the way there on January 6th, but we'll endeavor to get rid of it. Hillary Clinton apologized. She shouldn't have. Basket of deplorables. And with that, my co-host Jay Fidel is with me today to discuss the emerging strength and influence of Christian nationalists in the Republican Party. Good morning, Jay. Good morning, Tim. You know, Jay, let's let's talk about some of the positions that the Christian nationalists are are hoping to accomplish, uh, not in just 2024, but uh, for the future of this country. And um, we can kind of go down the list, and I'm going to throw some of these at you to get your response. Uh, they would like to stop divorce and, and make it back in the old days where um, no fault uh, is gone, and now you have to find cause for a divorce. They want to stop contraceptive, uh, contraceptives. They want to stop same-sex marriage. And presumably, they're all probably okay with discrimination of housing and, and job employment. They probably don't have a problem with that. Uh, they want to stop any kind of sex transitioning uh, activities that are occurring in this country. Uh, they would definitely want to ban abortions. And um, in my opinion, these people want to go back to the days of John Winthrop and um, his clan of Puritans that uh, really messed up for America. The Puritan uh, lifestyle um, really made things tough on the, American, uh, the Native Americans. Uh, your thoughts about other things that this, these Christian nationalists are up to? Uh, they want to break down the wall between church and state. Uh, I've seen commentary by Bobert and Marjorie Taylor Greene saying, are you ready for this? Are you sitting down? <laughs> I'm tired of the Establishment Clause. I'm tired of this wall we have between church and state. <clears throat> I think church ought to be in charge and state ought to respond to church. Um, you know, what do you mean tired? You're tired of the Constitution? You're tired of the First Amendment? You're tired of the Establishment Clause? That doesn't change it. But what they, you know, what they are doing is they're ignoring it, and uh, and thus, uh, as you said, um, they're ignoring democracy. They want to, you know, trash democracy. They want to trash the Constitution, and and this this comes uh, from a comment from Trump. You know, I I have to reconsider the Constitution. Some of the Constitution I'm not going to follow. Um, so what we what we have here is a an uh, anti anti democracy movement, um, and it's it's largely about the First Amendment. You know, I'm going to throw out a quote from Trump 
because um, to your point, Donald Trump is supporting these Christian nationalists. He doesn't care about them. He doesn't believe in what they believe in. But um, they're a, a sizable block of his voting base. And he said this. Uh, this was at, um, in his Nashville um, uh, rally that he had. He said, remember, every communist regime throughout history has tried to stamp out churches, just like every fascist regime uh, has tried to co-opt them and control them. Well, you know, lately he's been accusing Joe Biden of being both communist and a fascist. So he's talking about the current administration, the Biden administration, as now being um, anti-Christian, anti-church, and uh, really trying to stir up all the Christian nationalists to say, uh, see, this is, a, this is the dark government we, we have to live with, and this is Joe Biden, and his, uh, his administration is trying to stamp out your right to peacefully assemble and worship. It's, it's misinformation, disinformation, manipulation. You know, the, the notion of evangelicals has existed in the American mm, public conversation, or maybe private conversation, at some points, uh, all the way through from, you know, before the revolution. And it comes from the fact that a lot of, a lot of um, you know, religious people were involved in policy and the formation of the government, but they decided at the time of the Constitution, to separate those things with good cause, because they saw what had happened in Europe, and they were concerned about those who would make this a theocracy. So <clears throat> it, it was sidetracked. But that didn't end it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the notion of um, evangelical um, order and theocracy has existed even from then till now. Uh, and I, you know, without going into the details of it, um, you know, it played a role in the post-Civil War experience with the, the Blacks. It played a role in many elements of American history, but it never got to be a serious um, maneuver to achieve a theocracy until now. And really, um, you know, I, I wonder if we could examine a why. Until now, um, it, it hasn't been, but it is now. You know, in the 30s, there were people who wanted to side with Hitler. They wanted to have fascism in the country. And um, there were factors that stopped them. Well, one of the factors was FDR. Uh, one of the factors were there, there were immigrants who really cared and were very patriotic. And the biggest factor of all was World War II where we saw with our own eyes that fascism was a murderous, um, a, a murderous view of the world. <laughs> and so we didn't have fascism. Um, and those factors are worth looking at now because there's a movement uh, to make this a theocracy, um, to, have, to have those who pretend to be religious zealots govern the government. And they'll say it in so many words. Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert, they say it in so many words. They want to throw out um, the division between uh, church and state. That's, that's really horrendous. Because, you know, everybody has a different view of God and church and state. Um, and if you, if you open the door on that, what, what happens is the ones with the view um, that serves their interest um, will, you know, dispossess the ones who don't have that religious view. So it's a question of interpretation. And there are virtually hundreds of, of religions in this country. So which one governs? White Christian nationalism? Is that what governs? What is that? And who runs it? And who believes in it? And I, I told you before the show, I think this is reduced to, to its simplest and most basic terms by saying the system is broken. And we can, you know, discuss how and why. And it creates a vacuum of power. That's what's happened. Sort of like the Depression in the 30s that led to the vacuum of power that allowed the Nazis in the door. And now we have a vacuum of power that allows the theocrats in the door. Um, and the theocracy is not about God. It's not even about religion. It's about power. And Trump, you know, who is a smart guy and is kind of fundamental, primitive, uh, uh, you know, intuitive level, 
understands this. He understands there's the vacuum. He wants to fill the vacuum. He knows that people need to fill the vacuum with power. So a good device is to call it theocracy and thus use theocracy as a way to get into power. And that's the game he's playing. He is actually allowing this. He is inviting this. Um, it could exist without him, but with him, it moves much quicker. Well, let's look at the, the influence of Christian nationalism that it's already had in the influence of our government. Uh, look at the composition of uh, the Supreme Court. Many of those justices are very conservative Catholics. And I hate to say, but it appears that they, they make decisions based on their Catholicism or their belief thereof. Uh, let's look at the most recent one, and that's uh, our Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, uh, makes no apology for his desire to blur the line between church and state. Um, the appointment of Mike Johnson, how do you think that's going to rear its ugly head as far as the Christian nationalist aspect towards uh, future legislation or the lack thereof, things that won't get on the floor? History will, will not be kind to him. He is, you're right, he is the personification of God over government, God over the people. And by the way, it's his God. It's not your God or my God or the God for most of us. It's his God. It's power. And, and Trump runs him. That's the other part. It seems clear that Trump runs him. Trump takes away his power and fills um, Johnson's power uh, with his Trump's instructions. So Trump is using this whole system, this whole movement, um, this whole theocracy thing for his own ends. He's controlling Johnson. History will not, it will not look kindly at Johnson. Johnson is, is in there against Ukraine because Trump wants him to be in there against Ukraine. And he can come up with religion, re, religious reasons for that, but that's, that's, that's bunk. It's just because Trump controls him. And in fact, Putin controls Trump. So that's why he doesn't want to give any money to Ukraine. And it's that simple. It's almost like a border is an irrelevant manipulation. It's Ukraine that they're after. So I don't. I, I think that um, I think that Johnson is a terrible choice uh, for the country, and ultimately, as you suggest, uh, for the GOP. They'll never recover from what they're doing now. They'll never have credibility again. Uh, I only hope that that uh, Trump loses the election so we can look at this rationally. Well, I, I don't think it ends with Donald Trump losing the election. I think there's enough of um, mega, if you will, the mega concept or theology that's embedded in the GOP. And whether Donald Trump is elected or not now, I think is, is um, almost moot. I think the, the movement continues on after Donald Trump is uh, hopefully not elected. Mm -hmm. um, you know, let's go back in history, and, and, you know, I hate to point fingers, but I'm going to do that. I'm going to point some fingers. Uh, Ronald Reagan, much beloved by, um, by the Republican Party, um, by many Americans, much loved, but he alone basically allowed uh, Jerry Falwell and the moral majority into the Republican Party. Uh, they're not like ever before had any religious group, particularly evangelical, had— um, you know, I had a, a, the nose under the tent of a Republican Party or the Democrat Party. So well, that's Falwell where was remarkable in the sense that he's the first leader of the evangelicals uh, to care about and insinuate himself into politics. Up to that point, they had been interested in, in religion, religious education, with their own view of the world, but not politics. And, and don't and forget donations were, over the TV. So, lots of donations but, over TV. For them, you know, yeah, for, for right. the guys in, in the mega churches, not for politics. Uh, Ronald Reagan, you are absolutely right. Ronald Reagan invited uh, Falwell uh, into the political arena, and it changed evangelicalism right there. And since that time, evangelicals have been involved in politics and power and less so in religion. Yeah, well, let's see how it's, you know, basically he's leaving his thumbprint on uh, some Supreme Court decisions. 
I'm reminded that um, Washington State, we had a football coach who insisted to conduct prayer on the field before game time. Um, didn't matter if you're a Christian or not, you were, you were a part of the team. You were going to take a knee and you were going to bow your head in, in prayer. Now, um, that decision to allow the coach to continue to do that was upheld by the Supreme Court. Now, if I'm a Muslim, if I'm Jewish, if I'm, I'm Hindi or I'm Buddhist, um, I'm not liking the fact that I'm forced to bow my head and uh, conduct myself in a Christian prayer. But there it is, one of the Supreme Court decisions that said, no problem. Uh, let's look at uh, public funding, our taxpayer dollars for funding for religious private schools. Again, a Supreme Court decision. How far does this go? What are areas, what other areas may we see either the Supreme Court or, or state legislatures to give a green flat or green light to um, the blurring the line of, of a church versus state? Well, you know, it was clear what direction we were moving at the inauguration of, uh, of Bush, W. Bush. Um, he said, um, let's do faith-based government. My administration will be faith-based. I said, what? What about the separation of church and state? What are you saying? But that was, it made it visible. Um, and, and, you know, clearly it's, it's uh, increased since then. But you can see that something very troubling happened at that point. You know, up to that point, the Department of Justice had been involved in um, trying to make sure that government was not faith-based. All of a sudden, in his administration, um, the Department of Justice changed to protect churches, to protect them so they could do what they wanted. Uh, it was a whole shift, a major shift in the, in the paradigm and the policy of this country. And it happened with George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, but I'd like to, you know, if I'd like to, you know, just raise one point that I find very troubling. <clears throat> First of all, we know that a good percentage of the GOP magas are evangelicals. I, I don't remember the exact number, but it's uh, well over 30% of them are committed to evangelical government, you know, the theocracy. Just, that's the, a, a, a poll taken recently by the Pew organization found that. And it, it's, by the way, some Democrats believe that too, but not nearly as many as the, as the MAGAs. Um, okay, now we have this very strange kind of inconsistency uh, that I cannot reconcile. And that is that there's something called a Christian Zionist within uh, the evangelical group. They believe that because the Jewish people and Israel is mentioned in the Bible, you know, in the, the First Testament, um, that they have a special connection with the Jewish people and Israel. Ergo, when you see Trump moving um, the embassy of the United States from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, when you see him supporting Israel, <clears throat> and especially Netanyahu, who is a kindred spirit um, and a kind of an autocratic personality with Trump, um, he's, he, Trump, is doing it for a reason. He's doing it to, to stroke these uh, evangelical Christian Zionists. And it, it's, it's good as far as Israel is concerned that they have this, this group in the United States that supports them. And of course, we have, we have the woke liberals who don't support them. Um, and the whole thing is very confused. And I hate to be on the side or, or sympathetic to the side of the evangelicals, but there you have it. They are uh, completely um, faithful, not to use that term. Uh, no, use that term. Israel. Use that term because it's it, it, it's important. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, they they, they it's some kind of uh, the theocratic uh, connection they have, and Trump is stroking that. Trump is taking advantage. He's playing to that. So it's I don't think it's really sincere, but uh, a number of the, for example, the YouTube videos that that come up, uh, the, the the news reports, even Fox News 
seems to favor Israel in this war with Hamas. Uh, you know, I I don't welcome them to do that, but they are doing that. And and I and I think we if we look at the evangelical movement, we have to wrap around that phenomenon because well, they, uh, one time they want to. Uh, on the one hand, um, they want to destroy democracy and the, and the line between church and state. On the other hand, uh, and Trump is, you know, stoking them on this, um, they want to support Israel for biblical reasons. Well, if you're an evangelical, you probably believe in the book of Revelations. And in the book of Revelations, um, guess who gets slaughtered first? Uh, the Jews in the Middle East when the second coming is is about ready to is ready to happen. Um, so yeah, they're more than happy to support support Jews because they know, according to Book of Revelations, if the Jews don't convert, then they uh, they receive the forces of evil and they're all they're all wiped out. Uh, easy to support that uh, when you are in the third or fourth rank of things uh, of things to come. So. You know, I wouldn't want that support if I was Jewish. I don't need that kind of support. Um, thank you so much. But yeah, also, look th thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> thanks, uh, but no you're, thanks. You're, you're right. And, you know, this very perverse why they support the Jews is because they think the Jews are going to be massacred. Uh, there it it's is. a very strange, twisted uh, kind of uh, mindset over it. Yeah, uh, well, uh, you said it perfect. Thanks, but no thanks. I don't need that kind of support. But let's look at something else um, that I've been saying, and, and you and I, have, we've gone around and around the mulberry bush on this, is that we accuse uh, the mega of being in an information bubble of, of facts from Fox News or Newsmax, whatever they get their news source from. Um, but there's something greater to that. And that is when your base is a bunch of uh, faithful, and you use the word faithful, evangelicals, remember, the evangelicals, they don't need proof to support their faith. They just need faith. So they need belief. They don't need facts. They don't need proof. They don't need evidence. They need faith. And when you have a political group that's based on the faithful, then who is their Messiah? Donald Trump. He doesn't give them facts. They don't need his facts. They just need to believe, and they do. And that is why Donald Trump has unloyal, I mean, excuse me, loyal followings to the nth degree because they are the faithful. There we are, that's our problem, part of it. So that's what happens, you fill the ranks with um, true believers that no longer need facts, science, or any of the above. And he asks them for money. Oh, they and love to are, give money, they're used to giving money. <laughs> they're, they're not the high-end givers, but there are a lot of them, and they are faithful to give, give him money. You know, one thing I can understand, and uh, maybe you can help me reconcile these, these differential points. On the one hand, the stats are clear. Americans are not going to church. They haven't been going to church for a long time. The second is that um, you have these Falwell kinds of uh, mega churches, much bigger than what he was doing then with Ronald Reagan, um, and schools, colleges even, uh, teach you know, evangelical Christianity. And of course, part of that is political now, a big part of it. Okay, and, and so you don't have people, Christians, who go to church in the various denominations, but what you do have is, A, these huge ball field, you know, demi-churches, semi, you know, quasi-churches out there with these ministers who are really good on a microphone, and thousands of people show up, thousands of them. It's a circus tent, kind of. Well, it's a circus, is what it is, and and not only that. And I and I have followed this as a technical matter. Um, a lot of broadcast equipment is designed for them. In other words, when that pastor quote gets up and addresses these thousands of people, um, he's not just talking to them. He's recording himself. There are twenty-seven cameras on him. He is broadcasting on the internet. He is reaching many, many, many more thousands of people. <clears throat> These guys are using modern technology. It's kind of a super social media thing to reach enormous numbers of people in the country and extend their influence. 
it's but it's not religion. If it's not religion, what else could it be? They talk about Jesus a lot, and they talk about Christianity, and they talk about faith, and they talk about turning the government over, too. It's not religion. What is it? Oh, I can answer that. Uh, if you ever watched, and I'm not going to do an imit uh, imitation of it, but if you ever watched Ernest Ainsley or Benny Hinn do faith healing on the stage, uh, your, your first description was pretty good, a circus. And that circus brings in a lot of money from the faithful, a lot of money, just like Donald Trump's bringing in a lot of money when he asked for it, because they're used to giving it. And when the, when the, when the call goes out, um, the, the term tithing comes up, but more than tithing. Uh, Donald Trump has played his faithful base as a bunch of suckers, and they've responded in kind. And that's a sad statement. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, attorney generals in every 50, 50 states should be looking at how Donald Trump is, is gaining his money and how he's spending it, uh, particularly from the um, RNC, 50 plus million dollars for his legal fees. Um, I'm not sure his faithful knew that they were going to be paying for his attorneys, but there it is. So what is it? It's a circus, Jay, and you, you hit it perfectly. Well, you know, <clears throat> it's really strange that, that uh, he should be the one that enables this. He should be the one that leads it. He should be the one that, that brings this, you know, huge circus tent of people into what is no more, no less than a cult. It's a cult for Donald Trump. They are the followers of the cult, and they believe in him, and therefore they come into the tent. But you know what? What is very interesting, and I was listening to this uh, on a podcast recently uh, from the New York Times, is he has the expectation that somehow he is going to get them to fund his underfunded campaign. He's behind Biden right now. He's he's going to get his base to cough it up, so to fund his campaign, um, which he needs. At the same time. He is asking his base to fund, this is a big question, to fund the half a, half a trillion dollars. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Half a trillion dollars that was awarded against him um, in the New York uh, fraud case. Okay, he wants them to pay for that. So add it up. You need about half a trillion to run a presidential campaign these days and uh, or more. Sorry. What well, they I, said I, was you needed a trillion dollars to run a presidential campaign, which he doesn't have, and he needs another half a trillion uh, to to pay off um, this this to to get the security together, right? So they don't collect on his his companies. They're not going they're not going to be able to do that. The church members just don't have that kind of cash either, and so th th he's going to run up against the wall on this trying to get the money to do both. Well, as of this morning, uh, his attorney said we could cough up $100 um, I don't think that's going to work. So they're asking the judge to reconsider the amount. Uh, $100 million is not going to cut it. Um, but I'm perplexed, Jay. Um, why would Donald Trump have to ask his, his minions of uh, uh, faithful followers for all this money when he's selling his tennis shoes for $399? Seems to me those golden Trump tennis shoes would win the day. Uh, give him all the capital he needs for his campaign and his attorneys. But I'm perplexed. That's just me. Well, it could be that people are not so interested in the golden shoes. Uh, that, uh, it could be that uh, he's, he's losing the confidence of his no, people. You should sell his are... golden, to golden toilet then to raise money. <laughs> so I don't know. You know, I mean, the, the question was is posed in his podcast, and Maggie Haberman of the New York Times is talking about it. You know, maybe maybe he doesn't have the same kind of draw, magnetism, charisma uh, that he used to have. Um, these these cases against him are having a negative effect on his brand. Uh, and this particular case with the half a trillion dollars, that's that's going to have a negative effect on his brand. So um, it could be that those members of the cult who might have been more enthusiastic a year ago, are no longer so enthusiastic. And God bless them for not being enthusiastic. Um, but but who knows? We don't know that he's, yet. He's a master at, at playing them. Uh, and I'm afraid he's much better at it than Joe Biden is. 
And so uh, he knows what we know, Tim. He knows what we're saying, and he's going to have solutions to the problem. You know, you had mentioned uh, that church attendance is down in the United States, and it certainly is, and certainly way, way down in Europe. Um, as the Christian nationalists get a greater foothold in the Republican Party and certainly in influence in government, uh, does this turn off Gen, Gen Z, the millennials? Uh, if you're a, a, a member of a minority religion in this country, uh, to what degree are you now, your alarm bells are going off going, uh, I'm not sure I like the, the way this sounds and smells. Uh, so what's your response if you're a younger or of a minority religion? Now, that is such a good point. And that's the point that Ian Bremmer was making in this other podcast I was listening to this morning. Um, you know, it's another generation coming. It's not the same, same generation that have supported him in his base. And they're younger, and they're more disenchanted, arguably. Um, they recognize the system isn't working. Um, they don't give him credit for doing anything to fix it in his first four years. Um, they, a lot of them do not believe that he can fix it in, in another four years. Um, and um, they're, they're disenchanted with the social institution. And he caused this, right? He spread this poison. Uh, they're disenchanted with the government. They're disenchanted with the social institutions. At the same time, this level of disenchantment may not be the same kind of benefit for him as before. And they may not be involved in the evangelical movement as their pr prior generations. So, you know, one thing we can be clear about is change. Things are changing. Things are changing in the remaining eight months. I, I always think of exactly how many months we have left. Uh, uh, things are changing even in the remaining eight months. And it could be that the new voters uh, either won't vote or will vote in a way that Trump won't like. And so we got to see about it. The evangelicals right now, today, would take Trump over the, over the, uh, over the, the threshold. He would win against Biden if the election were held today. Trump has, has gotten so many negative points on Joe Biden. But in the next eight months, the electorate may be different. The next generation of voters may be different. The world may be different. So we cannot say what will happen in November. Good point. The only thing I worry about is the old Christian song, Onward Christian Soldiers. And um, that has a double meaning, particularly if Donald Trump accuses the elections of fraud, as he did in 2020. And, um, you know, then we have that to contend with. Um, Steve Bannon's, all the, all the Proud Boys, the uh, Oath Keepers, um, you name it. Um, we haven't seen the end of this yet. So we'll see. No, and, and uh, let me say that, um, you know, we, we talk about... Uh, you know, the world in another Trump administration. And we, you know, we said, well, Ukraine will be over. I don't, I don't know what he'll do with regard to Israel. I guess uh, his, uh, you know, his evangelical base will want him to support Israel, and he'll do that. Um, but I, I think what is really, really scary is the First Amendment, the very point of this show. It's the possibility of a theocracy. And when I talk about Marjorie Greene, and I always do it with disdain and contempt, and I talk about Lauren Boebert the same, those, those two uh, are on the short list for vice president. They could be vice president, either of them. And if they are vice president with a, with a president who is um, not living a healthy lifestyle and is uh, already, what, he'll be in his 70s at the time, his 80s, at the time, just nearly as old as Joe Biden, um, they could be a heartbeat away from being president. Both of them have articulated the notion that they're really tired of the separation between church and state, and they would take it to a theocracy for political and power reasons, not religious reasons, but there you have it. So we could be a lot closer to a theocracy than we think, than we have ever been. Couldn't agree with you more, and it gets scarier every time I see these reports, or certainly have to watch CPAC. Um, incredible things are said uh, blatantly, openly, and, uh, you know, 
there they continue. So I'd like to thank you, Jay. I'd like to thank you for your time today. Do you have any last thoughts before we conclude? Yeah, uh, you know, people always ask at the end of these shows, so where's the bright side? What are the solutions to these problems that are burying us in, in malaise and, and uh, you know, concern? And um, these days, when I listen to those shows and hear those discussions, including now, today, I don't have a solution. You know, if I said to you, we got to go out there and vote, okay. I know what I'm going to do. You know what you're going to do. But a lot of people in this country are raw meat, and they can be turned one way or the other. And I fear that a lot of them are going to stick with this notion of Trump. Uh, they're going to forget all the they have already forgotten all the incredible, insidious things he did um, with respect to January 6th and so many other things. And they'll vote for him, forgetting that and thinking that his lies are true. And so I don't have a solution for you, Tim. I wish I did. Um, maybe something will occur to me next week. I have a quotation from the New Testament that summarizes the last five years and certainly this campaign uh, trail so far. Shortest sentence in the Bible, Jesus wept. And with that, I'd like to thank Jay Fidel, my co-host. I'm Tim Apicella. This is American Issues Take One, and won't you join us next week? And until then, aloha.